Yes, it's, it's obviously in the it's on the video machine. Your laptop is in the way of the uh, of the light. Um, but unfortunately, the problem is, right, it works brilliantly well, but it works. 
Um, and but there are many cases where actually it doesn't work terribly well. And water and ice is, is one of these examples, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, but we can we can do better than that. Correlated quantum chemistry, so the kind of thing that people have been using for many years in molecular chemistry, um, actually turns out to do very much better. So that's the message of this talk. Um, now let's just start off with ice one H. Right. So when it snows, um, what's falling from the sky is ice one H. Um, and as uh, right, everyone in this room knows that in ice one H, you've got water molecules that are fourfold coordinated with their neighbours. Uh, um, of course, this is all held together with hydrogen bonding. So each each water molecule is donating two hydrogen bonds to its neighbours, and it's accepting <coughs> two hydrogen bonds uh, from its other two neighbours. Um, now, if, if the technology works properly, <coughs> right. So this this diagram. It's not terribly easy to see what it is, but it's supposed to take, but I don't think it's to see the technology works. So if you look at this water molecule in the middle, you'll see what I've just said. Right? So here are two hydrogen atoms sticking out from the central molecule, and they're coordinated with two neighbors here. Um, but that central molecule is also receiving two hydrogen bonds, and here they are. Now, one, one of the great features of uh, <coughs> why does ice float on water? Well, I mean, just looking at this picture, um, the, the reason for this is already suggested, because there's an awful lot of open space. It's a very, very open structure. Mm -hmm. um, you can see this because, um, okay, so diffraction experiments on ice, of course, were done back in the 1920s. So people have known this for a very, very long time. Um, the nearest neighbor oxygen oxygen distances are about 2.8 angstroms. Right, so that's like this distance here. But if you go out to the second neighbor, right, so let's suppose you go from the <coughs> central molecule out to this molecule up in the corner here. That's a much larger distance. That's about 4.5 angstroms. Right, so a very, a very much larger distance to second neighbors implicitly means a lot of empty space. Right, okay, so you might say, well, that answers the question about why ice floats on water. Um, but, but of course the real question is not that. The question really is, well, why, why does ice prefer this structure rather than something different? Um, now, um, ice has got many, many different crystal structures. Um, John Finney, um, who was at UCL for a very long time and was still around to quite a quite extent, um, was responsible for discovering couple of ice structures. Um, so we're now up to about, about 15 different ice structures, but let's just concentrate on the ones at moderate pressures. Right, so here's ice 1H here, which I've just been talking about. Um, and that's stable up to about um, not, not a very high pressure actually. So that's um, so once you go up to a pressure of about another kilobar, you start to go up to other structures. Um, right, so there's ice 9, there's ice 2, ice 15, um, and I'm going to go as far as ice 8. So that's the structure that you get about uh, beyond about 20 kilobars. 20 kilobars is still not a very high pressure. I mean, those, those were pressures that were quite easily achievable in the times of Richmond. Um, right, so these, these structures here, or the general form of this phase diagram, has been known for quite a long time. Um, so let's just go straight to ice 8. <coughs> um, okay, so just as a reminder, up in the top left hand corner, um, that's the ice 1H structure which you just saw. But now let's just concentrate on ice 8, which is in this big picture here. Um, right, so now you'll see something totally different. Um, so look again at the central monomer. Um, here are the hydrogen bonds, exactly as before. The distance in ice 8 is actually almost identical to what it is in ice 1H. But the huge, huge difference is that you've now got four additional neighbours at almost equal distances. Right, so instead of being fourfold coordinated, it's essentially eightfold coordinated. And so just look here, for example, there's the central monomer. Here's a neighbor at a distance of 2.7 angstroms, but there's no alpha in God. 
Right, so in going, in going to a pressure of only about 20 kilowatts, you compress the ice structure to such a large extent that you brought in those second neighbors that were originally at a very large distance, and you brought them into much shorter distances. Now, did it take a lot, a lot of energy to do that? <coughs> well, no, it took an amazingly small amount of energy, in fact. Um, again, these facts have been known for an extremely long time. Um, take a look at this picture here. I've taken this picture straight out of an absolutely landmark paper, in my opinion. Um, this is by Angelos Michaelides and collaborators, published in 2011. Um, and they make the point in this paper um, that the, the energy differences are extremely small uh, in experimental reality, but DFT calculations get this completely wrong. Um, so first of all, let's have a look at the reality. And what we're seeing on this graph is the relative energies of different structures relative to the common form of ice, which is R1H. Um, as you go to the right, we're getting denser and denser structures. So let's go straight, straight to R8. That's the one you just saw with the eight mirrors neighbors. And there's the relative energy. This comes out of a rather cunning uh, analysis of experimental data, but it's just an experimental piece of information. And now let's have a look at this energy difference. This is the energy difference per molecule relative to ice one h And this scale, which you may or may not be able to see, that's in milli-electron volts per water molecule. Now, that difference is about 30 milli-electron volts. Um, now, bear in mind that chemical accuracy, so-called, is 1 kcal per mole. K K 1 kcal per mole is about 44 milli-electron volts. So this difference of energy that you're talking about between normal ice and this highly compressed form of ice 8 is less than kcal per mole. Um, if you prefer that in many arteries, that's about 1 kcal <coughs> Now, everyone who's done anything with DFT knows that you're going to struggle with DFT to get that kind of thing right. And indeed, DFT gets it completely wrong. Because here, right, so here's among solid state people, condensed amount of people, probably the most uh, the preferred default is the PBE approximation. But right, here's what the energy differences are doing with PBE, it's these black points here. And you can see that they're getting this energy difference right wrong when I've got a factor of six. Right, this is a scandalous state of affairs, this is just not good at all. Um, if, if that doesn't work, sometimes people like to go to hybrid functions. Here's PBE zero, but you can see it really doesn't make a lot of difference. Um, now, what they do in this paper is they say, well, the thing that's missing in uh, normal DFT is dispersion interaction. So, um, and then there are various ways of correcting the description of dispersion. That's these green, green symbols here, and it does improve things. Um, so, the green symbols show you. What's the, what happens when you correct the dispersion, but I mean, it's still wrong, basically. <coughs> um, just, just a few seconds on transition pressures. I mean, if you're getting the energies as wrong as this in DFT, then of course the transition pressures are going to come out wrong. And the transition pressures are coming out wrong typically by about a factor of 10. Right, so DFT is an order of magnitude wrong. <coughs> Um, I won't say anything about diffusion Monte Carlo, but, um, so my colleague Darren has been busy with this. Um, diffusion Monte Carlo is spectacularly good. Um, so if you look at these uh, cohesive energies and the electron volts, DMC is basically spot on, and the energy difference is coming out worse. Um, but, but just as an aside, if you look at the for dispersion, um, the energy differences do come out somewhat better, um, but you, you still wouldn't. wouldn't correct and there's still large errors. In, in fact, dispersion is not going to cause these problems. <clears throat> um, now, that, let me just say how we've been trying to do a bit better than this. Um, but let, let me just very briefly say, if, if TFT is just seriously wrong, which it is, um, let, let's try and break down the question and say, well, why is it wrong? So what's wrong? Well, there are a lot of things that could be wrong. Um, first of all, high combining is partly electrostatics. Okay, so you've got electrons, 
the sort of state of the office and the chemistry community. I mean, you've got more electrons on the oxygen and less on the proton. So, of course, there's a glug on the lens. Um, so, there's first order electrostatic, which is a two body effect. But then, of course, the molecules polarize each other. So, there's polarizability, there's exchange over that power of repulsion. There definitely is dispersion, of course, there is non local electron correlation. The monomers get the form of this, there's a lot of covalent. Um, so, so when you're saying what's wrong with DOT, what you really mean is out of all these different things, um, what's causing the problem? Um, well, one thing that a lot of people have done is to use a many body expansion, and because some of these uh, parts of the energy are two body effects, some of them are even one body effects, I mean, one of them is Some of them are definitely many body effects, like polarizability. Um, so a lot of people in the field have done, used a many body expansion. Right, so here's this E1, that's the energy of deformation of the monomers. E2, that, that's the pairwise interactions. Right, so if you use a pair potential, um, of course there are some quite respectable pair potentials like tip 3P and tip 4P. Um, if you use a pair, pair description, that's going to capture the two body interactions. But it will not include polarizability. Polarizability is a many body effect, so that comes in things like three body interaction. Right, so that kind of scheme has been used for a very long time. Um, and uh, so, so you can see that many body interactions are going to be incredibly important because it's been known since the time of Charles Coulson uh, that the dipole moment of water increases enormously when you go from gas phase. Plus. It goes from 1.865 to at least 2.7 divide. So, so I mean, just the electrostatic interaction between molecules changes a lot because of the influence of the neighbors. Right, so now that we come to the point, well, so what have we been trying to do about this? Um, we, I will say in a minute, uh, is this is a collaboration with Fred and Manby in Bristol. Uh, a number of other people involved. I'll say more in just a few minutes. Um, so, what so Fred's idea about this, and I want to emphasize what I'm talking about now, um, is not really my ideas, it's Fred's ideas, and his, his group in Bristol. Um, so what they're saying is, let's use a many body expansion, so we'll have one body inter interactions, two body, three body, um, but let's not do it in, in a naive way, let's try and embed the, these molecules in the field. Right, so this expansion is going to do the calculations we have to do quantum chemistry calculations on monomers and dimers embedded in the field of their neighbors. Right, so that big increase of dipole moment, as I've just mentioned, is going to be included because of the field, the electrostatic field of all the neighbors. Right, so that, that's right at the flow of this scheme. And the embedding fields are going to represent Coulomb interactions, but also how they repulsion. There's a very nice paper last year which went uh, with these ideas. Of course, there are other groups doing this as well. Um, now, extremely briefly, here's how the embedding potential is made. Um, so, as I said, the embedding potential includes the Coulomb uh, fields of the surrounding neighbours. So, one simple way to calculate what that field should be is simply to do hub tree fog calculations on every monomer in the system in isolation. Right, so you just take this monomer, you put it in free space, you do a Hartree fog calculation, you calculate its charge distribution. Ergo, you know the electrostatic field due to that monomer. So that's what's done. That's the zeroth iteration. But then you iterate on that, because then that field polarizes the molecules, and you do the, the Hartree fog calculations again, but now uh, under the action of these. Uh, these fields, right, and you repeat that to self consistency. Right, so that's the basic idea of embedding potentials. Now, um, so what we decided to do on this was just to say this embedded many body interaction, uh, of course, we want to terminate this many body expansion at, at a very low order in order to be able to do quantum chemistry quite accurately. Um, so we're going to terminate this at second order. Okay, so in fact, we're able to do calculations on monomers and dimers, and that's how we're going to get the correlation energy in the system. So that, when I say EMD E2, that means embedded many-body expansion terminated at the second order. 
does it work? Um, well, we tested this on a number of different water systems. For example, here's the famous set of test systems, the water hexima, which comes in different forms. Um, the energetics of this has been beaten to death with extremely accurate quantum molecular quantum chemistry, and we know exactly what the situation is with this. Um, so what we've done is we've done half three far parts of the energy with uh, standard quantum chemistry. Uh, we could also do it with third wave calculations. And here's the correlation energy. Um, so initially we focus mainly on uh, second order mode pluses. And we do that in two ways. We do that just with direct root cause calculations on these uh, clusters. And we also do it with this embedded uh, many body expansion, terminated at second order. Okay, so the correlation is only being calculated on, on monomers and diamonds, but in the field of the neighbors. And then we just compare the two. Um, the, the calculations, uh, I should say the units here are millifunctions. That's millifunctions in the total energy of the system. And uh, so the calculations are correct to much better than uh, a, a, a tenth of a millifunction per moment. So they're, they're good to about couple of million electron volts per moment. Okay, so that works. And then we tested it on a number of other systems. I'll probably skip over most of this. Um, so here's a nice little example of something, something like that. Um, that's a water <coughs> nominal, I believe. I think that's got nine molecules in it. And if we take out the thermal sample, it can be tested to see whether this works. Right, now let me just cut to the chase. Um, does, does this work? Right, so this method is quite completely straightforward to apply to our structures. So now the question is, does it work? Um, what do you have to do? Well, you just do the, the uh, monomer and dimer calculations in, uh, embedded in the fields of the neighbors to get the correlation energy, and then you just do a rather standard hartree fock calculation on a crystal. You can either do that with, uh, well, we like to use platforms, but you could do it with a different voice. Um, <clears throat> now, when you look at these ice structures, right, so just casting your mind back 15 minutes, there's white ice 1H, which is, which is the normal everyday form of ice. There's the highly compressed form, ice 8. That, that's when the second neighbors come into the same distance as the first neighbors. Um, right, that has a much, much bigger density. And, right, so here's the hartree fock part of the energy. And uh, you, see, you can see from this that if it was just down to hartree fock, I say it wouldn't have a chance. Okay, it's seriously destabilized, as you would expect, because you're bringing together monomers which are not hydrogen bonded. That's energetically quite unfavorable for Coulombic and exchange overlap, uh, exchange of repulsion reasons. Right, that's captured by hartree fock. But that's almost exactly compensated for by the fact that the correlation energy um, becomes, it is a stabilizing effect. Right, there's, there's a, I mean, it's crudely speaking, there's a lot of band loss dispersion between those models. And uh, so that largely compensates. And when you add the two things together, here's the MU2 total energy of the crystals. And you can see, right, so there's the difference. Um, which is which is just over, uh, actually just under in this case, um, it's just under a millipartry, which is almost exactly what the experiment tells you. And so that seems to work extremely well. Um, there's, there's one wrinkle on this. Um, okay, so if you were going to believe this story, you would have to believe, okay, this is getting now a little bit technical. So we're using the so-called second order maliplastic treatment of correlation. What is that? That's basically second order perturbation theory with the correlation energy of the electrons. Now, is that good enough? Well, the answer is it's not at all bad, but it's not quite good enough. Um, sorry, I should have put up this. Right, so, there, there are the numbers that you saw before. Um, there are the experimental values of the cohesive energies. Um, this is a millihartree, which is a millihartree is 27 million electron volts. And so you can see these are incredibly close to the experimental values and also to the diffusion of carbon values. 
Now, the interesting thing is when, when you go to, I mean, we can do the same thing, uh, this embedding thing, we can do this with more accurate treatments of correlation. So, for example, the couple plus the theory at the singles, doubles, and the two to the couple level, that, that's often referred to as the gold standard of molecular quantum chemistry. That's much more accurate than MP2. Now, this shows you that there's a curious, a really curious and interesting wrinkle in this story. Um, because it turns out that, right, so you, you may remember about um, Axel Robertson, Axel Robertson, no, sorry, three body correlation. Um, this, this has been, uh, so when I first, did that, first started uh, being interested in computer simulation, that this was still in the days where people were spending a lot of time on the rare gases. Um, so what people had realized back in the 1960s was the three body correlations. It's not just two body dispersion, but three body dispersion is actually quite important as well. Now, if you look at any of the standard textbooks like Anthony Stone, um, you will always find the statement three body correlation is not important in ice. Now, that's true if you're talking about ice 1A, but it's not true as, as we've discovered if you're talking about ice 8. Um, so to get things absolutely right in comparison with experiments, it turns out you've got to include that, and you've also got to include the slight modification of the two body correlation that comes, comes from a couple of clusters. Anyway, that, this is getting into small details now. Um, but anyway, so if, if one really wants to understand um, the, the energetics of ice structures, it seems that this is at least one way of sorting out the, the physical chemistry of this. Now, this, I, I think, may, may have a, a sort of broader application as well. Um, because the fact is, it's not just water where DFT has serious problems. It, it's having serious problems with a lot of molecular materials. Um, so I, I do believe that there's quite a lot of knowledge, I think there's going to be quite a lot of knowledge in seeing how all this works for a lot of other systems as well. Um, okay, so there's no reason one shouldn't apply this to way through solutions, but here's an important example, gas hydrates. Right, this is hitting the news right now because, because you, you know, the newspapers are all saying that there's more energy locked up in gas hydrates than everything else put together. Well, that may or may not be true, but, but for certain, gas hydrates like methane hydrates are, are extremely important, um, both as possible sources of energy, but also for climate change reasons. Um, and DFT is notorious for getting the energetics, energetics of gas hydrates wrong. The reasons, presumably, must be the same as they're getting water wrong. So there's an interesting application. Pharmaceutical materials, I've, I've only put this in because Sally Price <coughs> is um, doing great things in this department on the energetics of pharmaceutical materials. Those, those are mainly molecular materials where, again, if you're going to calculate the energetics correctly, um, DFT is likely to have problems. Liquid crystals, I mean, one could go on. There are plenty of examples of systems where this kind of embedded main body expansion is likely to be useful. And it's, it's beautifully suited to parallel computing because all these one body and two body terms, you know, you just distribute them over a bunch of processes. And in fact, a number of the calculations that I should do done in exactly this way. Uh, we can take a few the photographs. Let's see. Now, I've, I've emphasized already, actually, that these, these embedding ideas are not uh, right. I've taken no credit for this whatsoever. Fred Manley's group has been uh, promoting these ideas, but there are other groups doing similar things. Um, Peter Bulgrave uh, was uh, one of the, uh, was, uh, okay, he finished his studentship recently in Bristol and did, did a lot of hard work in uh, developing these methods. Dario Alfaya also mentioned um, these calculations could not have been done without Dario because he was responsible for all the hard work before. Um, okay, so, so I conclude again, okay, so I can't, I can't honestly say this was uh, directly inspired by Patrick, but I just, I just want to say again, um, the experience of working with Patrick was an absolutely wonderful experience, um, and I, I just have really warm and happy memories of that time.
Thank you very much. Okay, so I didn't, I didn't really touch on this. So ice one of course, is proton disorder, right? So this comes back to the Pauling rules. Um, the, the fact that the water molecule, right? So, so each water molecule has to be involved in four hydrogen bonds with its neighbors, but that leaves plenty of orientation freedom. Uh, so it isn't disorder of the table. Um, this, this, I think, uh, you know, because, because I have, so one, one interesting aspect of this is the dielectric constant drops. Um, so simple models have trouble with the dielectric constant. I mean, they tend to get it wrong by sometimes a factor of two. Um, DFT is not going to get it right, I don't think, but not all that much has been done, it, I don't believe. The, the question about the, the, the relative energies of ordering these or ordering or disordering the water molecules in different ways. This, this, the, these embedding methods would be absolutely excellent for us, I think. So we haven't even thought about that, but, but I think there's a lot of scope for doing interesting things there. Mm. Yeah, because one of the reference systems for that would be probably the salvation energy of protons. Salvation energy of protons? Yes. Yes. Which is a canonical energy which is known for very high precision and yes. You can, you can yes, yes, yes. No, I think, I think that's another extremely interesting uh, thing that needs to be looked at. I mean, so by the way, um, although I didn't mention lattice defects, I mean, lattice defects are hugely important in us, of course, the bureau of defects, um, the, de the kind of defects that break the pooling rules about, about uh, hydrogen bonding. Um, so, I mean, th this is also on our list, this, this will be a good The other thing which is quite exciting about this is that we can get sort of templating the water on various polar surfaces. Yes, yes. Um, it's very un unsatisfactory when you've got potentials that are not going to get the various crystal structures relative yes. to each other. Yes. Yes. Now we can have a lot more confidence in those sorts of situations. Yes. Yes. Mm. Of course, talking about templating of water on uh, polar I mean, so, so silver iodide had this case of this. I mean, seeding clouds with silver iodide to try and make it rain. Um, of course, you don't need, don't really need DFT to start doing that. But I mean, so so DF, DFT calculations actually give rather poor results with the last mismatch. Um, so again, that's absolutely you know, one could address that kind of problem. Thank you. 